Welcome to the Millionaire Next Door podcast with Robert Curtis, CFP, accredited investment fiduciary from Signature Estate and Investment Advisors. In this podcast, we help successful wealth accumulators like you looking to transition to a work optional lifestyle by helping you build strategies for growing and maintaining your wealth. Robert draws from years of experience and fiduciary responsibility and interviews guest experts to help you build reliable strategies to grow and maintain your wealth. Now, on to the show. We're moving deeper into 2022 in a world that continues to amaze. So let's find out what some of the hot topics are for clients of Rob Curtis. I'm Patrice Sikora. Rob, you say retirement plans and Social Security are in many people's minds. And, and what else are you hearing? Oh, yeah, they, they are. I mean, it's it's tax time right now. So as we record, the April, it's April Fool's. No, no joke here, but I'm not sure when this will ultimately be released. But people are going through their returns. So in many cases, they're having conversations with their tax preparer, unless they do it themselves on their own software. And sometimes they can see the benefits of making retirement contributions uh, such that they a number kicks out, or this is what they owe in taxes, which what I'm hearing is a lot of people are really like, wow, I owe an awful lot in taxes. Mm. And in other cases, you, you, know, you can plug in if you were to contribute to a retirement plan and it's a lot less because there's an offset to your income. And so sometimes it just shifts your payment instead of going to uh, the, Fe- you know, the Federal Reserve and your state, you can, you can pay less. So you know, the amounts are going up. I set up a lot of SEP plans, profit sharing, 401ks. The amounts last year were 58,000. They're jumping to 61,000. I- I'm gonna talk about that in a bit. Okay. And, and I'm gonna touch on some changes in social security that that sounds like a little bit of a yawner topic. It's not the hot topic, but there was a 5.9% increase in the payment this year, which is the first time in a long time. And a lot of that ties into inflation. So we're gonna maybe segue into some of the hot topics. Um, And there are some definite hot topics that are on people's minds and driving, driving a lot of things these days. So. So that's that's what I'm hearing. Yep. All right. Uh, Before we get into that, remind me about the sounding board process you have and and how this helps people keep on top of things. Yeah, well, well, absolutely. We we have what I call a sounding board process and I'll I'll allude to it here. But there's a lot going on in the world right now. There's really a lot. Most people are probably pretty aware that uh, Russia has invaded Ukraine. This is a big a big issue. Anytime there's geopolitical events, that's a big issue, especially when one of them is, you know, a nuclear power Mm -hmm. or, you know, so what I call the sounding board process is, um, is frankly put, a lot of people are not sure about their strategy or what's going on, or, or maybe even if they're working with another advisor, how that's going. There's been a lot of choppiness in the market. The market started the year off, not, not in a great way. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk and get in depth about that, but the sounding board process is simply, I mean, we are really a sounding board for our clients. We, we talk them through these. We we're not just watching CNN or, or Fox or whatever kind of news. We have a lot of insights into things and we, we give people some peace of mind, but we really talked through things objectively and the sounding board could also apply to family, to friends, to people that they care about, to clients, to listeners. If someone's out there and they're feeling some anxiety, some nervousness, some anticipation, some angst, and they want to talk with someone to, to really hear what's going on and get a second opinion, and, and, and we're there as a sounding board. We, we like to call ourselves our, the noise canceling headphones for clients. <laughs> We've seen these things, but we're we're aware of them. And usually, a conversation is super helpful. We'll let you know if there's things you could be doing to to make an adjustment, or or how big of a deal they are or are not from from our perspective. So that's the sounding board process. We we make no. You know, if you are introducing this to someone who wants to, we do that out of honor and respect for our relationship with our clients, regardless of whether they ever become a client. In fact, when we sit down in a sounding board process to maybe give them, get to know them a little bit, have them get to know us, 
we're not looking to to bring on a new client immediately. I mean, it's certainly not in that meeting. If if there's a good fit, a good alignment, we might set something up in a future call or meeting, but that's not the point. We're just if many people will introduce us because they feel someone's being really underserved, you know, or someone has reached out to them saying, I'm not so sure about these markets, what my advisor is doing, what my strategy is. I, I'm really nervous. I'd like to, or I'd at least like to talk with someone. So, so that's what the sounding board process is. Rob, in, as you said, things have been extremely erratic this year so far. Have your clients seen this much turmoil and geopolitical upheaval in their time in the markets? Or is this, um, is this new for many of them? I don't. <laughs> it's funny that. So here's here's an example of a sounding board. I don't think it's new. I think it's pretty, pretty uh, typical, to be honest. But there are a lot of cross currents going on. So we, we all you know, we just finished the pan- we didn't finish the pandemic. OK, we're going to live with right. the pandemic. And there's another new variant that I I can't even pronounce or haven't committed to memory exactly what this new one is called. But there's always some new thing that replaces it. And so I think throughout the last year and a half or so, we had sort of an absence of volatility. And that became uh, something, there's something called the VIX, V-I-X, that measures market uh, sensitivity. And that spiked way up. But these things are normal. These are very normal. Um, I'll tell you what's a little abnormal or things that we're, we're looking at. We... we um, we let clients know about this a long time ago. I mean, let, let's go back to the lockdown, okay, to, to March of 2020. Okay, huge reaction in the markets because it was a big, big deal, obviously a pandemic, but we'd never locked down before. And then um, it didn't take that long before markets sort of came in and there, there was a, a, you know, very large fiscal stimulus from from the federal government. And this was a global synchronous type of thing with a lot of big central banks pumping out money like crazy. So they kept going and we're used to using in government terms, billions, you know, terms in the billions. All of a sudden, things are now in the trillions and billions are are, um, not that meaningful. So we're talking something like five, six trillion dollars of money was created. And there was a lot of stimulus put into the system, the long and short of it. And we we advise clients throughout all this that w- there's a term called M2. If, if you had mm-hmm. economics mm-hmm. and you remember this thing, the, the money supply. So that went up 40% throughout the pandemic. That is a giant number. So all these top economists I talked to, and I met with a bunch last week, I mean, there's people, their whole careers, they don't even know if we've ever done this. I mean, we, we might even, I don't know if World War II compares, but I mean, it is a gl- massive stimulus. And then, so, so we started positioning for inflation a long time ago. We knew there was no, there's no way that you can create 40% more money and not create inflation. It's just a matter of time. So are these unprecedented times? No, in that sense, they are. But the market's grappling with a lot of things right now. I think it was already struggling with interest rates. They've been kept artificially low for a very long period of time. And the Fed, the Federal Reserve, is way behind the curve. They were completely behind the curve on inflation. They called it transitory forever. And we were like, what are you talking about? That That's crazy. Obviously, now everybody sees it with the price of gas. You know, if you're getting work done on your home, all these commodities, uh, copper, iron ore, natural gas. I mean, you're really, they're really hurting in Europe. I mean, they were so dependent upon Putin and Russia and they shut down their nuclear and they came completely dependent on Vladimir Putin. I mean, that was just not a wise idea whatsoever. So we're actually faring a whole lot better in this country, but there's a lot going on and the Federal Reserve increased interest rates last month they, they probably did so to a lesser extent because of the geopolitical tensions with, with Russia and, you know, invading Ukraine. Um, but we, from what we read in the futures markets, thinks there's maybe six to eight times of rate increases coming in the next year, year and a half. The market is, has a lot to absorb between that, 
between geopolitical events, between um, supply chain issues, and then things that got got out of out of out of whack due to energy issues that again that are much more acute and obvious in in Europe and places that are highly dependent upon Russia. So, but do I see these as abnormal? No. There, there are things that occur. There are things we deal with. That's why we have a process. That's why we're a sounding board. And we go through it unobjectively, you know, unemotionally in a rules-based way. And uh, uh, talking, talking a lot here, but as I look back, things that we did that we did right, that we did well, we were talking about this 9, 12 months ago. And we positioned, we put people into commodities, into copper, iron ore, into broad-based basket of commodities, into energy. And you remember like a year and a half, two years ago, I mean, people were leaving oil and the energy, you know, they thought that was dead. So, Which it I mean, never we, is. I don't understand that. It never, it is. never is. I mean, and I, I live in California, so I understand the green thing. I'm a pretty environmentally focused person myself, but we're going to be continuing to use oil and petroleum for years. It's going to grow through 2050. It's just just the reality of it. So at any rate, I don't want to get too much on a sidetrack on that, but we, you know, we put things, we had a lot of Chevron in there. We, we put a lot of defense stocks in there, Lockheed Martin. We actually put an Israeli defense company, if you can believe this, they're pretty big time over here, but they're not that well known. Just through tactical and strategic things, they I I don't know how to I'm no expert on this, but if if somebody's gonna send a, a nuclear missile over, you know, we maybe have eight seconds to respond. They have, you know, one, if that. Right. So they have to be more on their game than we do maybe and that focus so any rate they have some very advanced systems that also deal with cybersecurity. we put those things into portfolios those worked out really well i i you may have heard like a several weeks back i mean germany just made a decision to increase their spending on defense you know to three percent of gdp and those defense stocks lockheed martin northrop grumman raytheon those all rallied and we just we don't think things are getting that much rosier and more secure. So we, we you know, they're spending more and we, we get that. So, you know, as a result, our clients who took these positions several months back experienced fewer and arguably less severe pullbacks so far this year. So that's what we did. Right. That helped absorb things that, that we this was nothing new to us. We saw these situations developing we we responded that's why we have a strategy all right what about yeah. earnings though what about earnings are they any part of your your um uh equation uh earnings are giant earnings matter we're always focused on earnings and they're actually from what i've heard you know a lot of corporate earnings are better than ever they're having some of their best they're figuring out how to adapt they are not shy about raising prices if their inputs go up and because oh my gosh we might lose a client or a customer here it's it's a reality but but we pay a ton of attention to that that's super important we're always focused on that we you know we're looking for we we have a process we we like lower risk, high economic moat type companies that that's mean where the barriers to entry, you know, be very difficult to start a new defense company in this environment or a new, you're not going to start a new railroad in North America. You know, it's just not going to happen. So those would be examples. We want world leaders, best in industries, you know, disciplined companies, shareholder friendly managements over many, many years. We, we, we know who acts well, who's been in, you know, you look at Warren Buffett and Berkshire. It's been right. very good to shareholders. There's others, I, I won't mention names, that they, they've just not been good actors. I don't feel they're good stewards. We don't feel like they're good places. Sometimes they're in lots of, you know, mutual funds. We avoid those things. But we want good management, strong industries, smart, high, gro- high companies that are making, you know, very high profit margins. It, it really varies. How, you know, what kind of businesses would you actually want to be in if you were starting a business? We want low or no debt. I mean, with interest rates rising and significantly, and I'm going to talk some more about that in the future. If you have a lot of debt, that's that's going to be a 
big, big problem. And that's where companies really run into severe problems. So also generally lower debt companies are just sort of um, stronger companies. They're generating lots of positive cash flow and they, they, they don't need to take on debt. In other cases, I mean, Apple, for example, that has, I think, more cash than any company in the world, they took on some debt. They didn't need to take on any debt. The, they could borrow at 1% interest rates and, um, and uh, you know, obviously grow a lot faster than 1%. So they took it on strategically. But companies that rely on that kind of debt that are heavily indebted, or when they see interest rates rise, they're going to be in trouble. So earnings 100% matter. We follow that. They've been pretty good. But, but we that's part of our process. Other things we've been really paying a lot of attention to is just our strategic positioning. The fixed income market has not been good. Bonds, it's been horrible. Yeah. It's been a really, I mean, if you think stocks have been bad, and that's presumably the safe area of people's portfolio. So when you see things go down 5 10%, uh, off something that's yielding three percent, that's a that's a disaster. That's a horrible trade-off. We we hate having that conversation. So we track all this. We had been underweight, you know, fixed income for, for the most part. There's about 40 subsectors of fixed income. And as it turns out, there's like two or three of those that are actually halfway decent. Everything else stinks and it's to be avoided with caution. Unfortunately, that's what the world's telling us right now. The number one is actually inverse fixed income. If you can believe this, that's the opposite of fixed income. It's a category. The only areas that are really working, there's one area called, there's a short duration. These are bonds that don't go out very far in maturity. They're going to be short duration kind of means they're not that sensitive to interest rates. Those have worked. And so when those when those mature, they'll be able to reinvest the, the, the proceeds at higher yields. There's another area called floating rate. So as those mature, it, or the, the rates are able to float up as interest rates float up. So it's going to be far less sensitive to interest rate increases. But, you know, we're so we're on the ball or we're always watching with respect to what's working, what's not working. We had a large position in convertible bonds throughout most of the bull market. And that's an area that's it's sort of part stock, part bond. It's got some elements of both, but it benefited because it was a more aggressive area of of the bond market, kind of with some equity component. But that did exceedingly well. We made some really nice profits. We've exited out of there because it's weakened in this environment. But, you know, I've said it over and over. It's, it's not always just what you own, it's, but it's what you don't own. And we, you know, we, that can be really, really important. So we're paying attention. We, we, earlier was a better time to get into commodities. We don't think that trend is over by far, but we've been watching this. And these are some of the adjustments, but earnings always, always matter. Yeah. Now this is a, you were talking big picture here, big companies. Let's, let's bring it down a little bit. What about yeah. the small businesses? Are you still pretty active there? Yeah, market-wise, let me j just a uh, couple things jump out there for me. But but larger companies have done better. Small companies, in terms of market cap, have been more. They're more risky. They have longer term, maybe more growth, but they've been more volatile. We we've avoided that. But I I think where you were going with that was was in reference to small businesses in Absolutely. this country. Yeah. So small businesses. Um, and you know, I deal with a lot of business owners and small businesses. These could be a, a law firm. It's still a small business, um, a dental practice, you know, um, a restaurant. We we could go on. I have a lot of different niche businesses, consultants, even myself, a financial advisor who's you know, in business. Um, yeah, we're seeing they need a lot of help. A lot of them did have very good years last year. Certainly, a lot of the folks we deal with. And they're looking at large tax bills. So we can set up retirement plans for them. And a lot of cases, they already have them. A lot of the independent contractors or sort of solo people set up what's called a SEP plan, SEP. And these are great plans. I mean, there's there's virtually no administration. We can the, When I talk about these investments inside of them, we can be super flexible. Um, we, you know, we're not limited to a set of investments. One can put in 58 up to $58,000 in 2021. Uh, and that number has jumped to $61,000. 
uh, it's it's 20 percent or 20 percent of your earnings up to a wage base this year of 305,000. That's how they get at the 61,000 number. But again, we're seeing a lot of people having conversations with their tax professional and they're finding they they want to get these amounts in. If they could offset $58,000 of income and sort of super fund their retirement and they can do this each and every year, that's a, you know, with the right kind of mm-hmm. investments, that's a really, really powerful strategy. So they're having these conversations and in some cases, we like to, we have folks just making these, I'm getting calls and emails all, all the time that, that, you know, in the next couple of weeks where people are dropping amounts in, this is what my CPA said I could do, or this is what I can afford. In other cases, if they're going to do 58000 that's great. Some people can just write that check and it goes in. But we find with a lot of business owners that, you know, when you're doing your taxes at this time of year, you might owe some money for last year for, you know, you underest, you probably owe your quarterly estimates. Right. And then you've got your 58,000. That can be a large cash outflow. So we, we have plenty of people running successful businesses that have the wherewithal want the deduction. That's a good thing. But in other cases we say, you know, maybe we get going ahead of time. We fund that monthly, we fund that quarterly it's not such a big shock. Plus, then we can get the benefit of compound interest maybe 16 months earlier. So they might already want to be starting on their 2002 too. I mean, some, some people will sort of, I want to wait to see what the accountant says. But if we sort of know where things are going or if you do it every year, but we're dealing with that a lot uh, all the time. I'm In addition, I'm setting up 401ks for, for companies. That's a little longer process. Um, but we help them ferret that out. We vet that out. You know, those amounts are lesser, but when combined with the profit sharing, we can get to that 58 and 61 number. We do that all the time. I, I love that for the deduction for, you know, the, the title of the podcast is millionaire next door, right? So mm-hmm. the, the overnight 25 year success story. So when you think of making these kind of contributions each and every year over 25 years, you can start to snowball and things can, you know, we see some really large accounts. And, and it just another area I want to talk on is we see a lot of clients reaching out to us, especially during these, you know, more volatile times or we're in, like my 401k is, uh, you know, with my employer, I'm yeah. not sure how that's going. Can you help me out with some advice on what we should be doing? And I set these up so I understand them very well, but there's limited number of options in there. You don't, you're not going to be able to put in a defense company or, or there might be something tied to, to commodities or inflation, but not much. There's going to be tips or something like that. There's not going to be a lot of choices. So they say, wow, could you, could you give me some guidance? Or I really wish you could manage this the way you're managing my other accounts, my trust my my iras my sep these kinds of things and 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 i'd like to have you coordinate that you know in an overall holistic view so we're not doing two things independent because i i don't know what i'm doing in that plan so what i tell these folks in a number of cases these retirement plans through an employer they're governed there's a thing called a plan document and it spells out how that plan operates most small and you can simply ask hr or your employer for the plan document within that in most cases there's a provision that allows for what are called in-service distributions so it's either a yes or a no and an in-service distribution if it's if it's a yes that enables that employee to to roll those funds out of the employer plan into their own ira to, with no tax consequences whatsoever. And then we can custom manage it for them. We can be linked to that and we can do all this stuff. And sometimes they think that's great. They feel much more comfortable with that. Uh, sometimes they, the plan doesn't allow that. But, you know, these employers sometimes like to put that in because they, you know, they have a lot of responsibility, fiduciary responsibility, as do we but for managing these plans. And if somebody would rather do their own thing or work with their own advisor and take the liability off them, they're like, that's great. We just wanted to provide this to you as a benefit and help you, you know, accumulate retirement savings while you work here. 
but I'm, I'm all into that space. I deal with it every day. It comes up a lot of text, but yes, that that's what we're seeing there. And by the way, on these plans, the 58,000, or if you're trying to get your 2021 contribution in, if you're a business owner, you get till tax filing day, you know, call it April 15th to make that contribution for a plus extensions. A lot of people are on extensions. Yeah. And then we should mention too, that just because you've got an extension doesn't mean you don't have to pay just yet. Oh, you have to pay your taxes. Yeah. yeah but you can get an extension or if you need more time to make that contribution. Right. But I think it's ideally to be on top of it, to get these things in because they become a really important strategy, you know, year after year to sock this money away. And, and I remember when these amounts were much smaller, you know, when a simple, when an IRA was $2,000, right? Now, if you're, you know, if you're I over laugh, 50. I do remember that too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I remember when Roth IRAs didn't exist, but, or, or now they're 7,000, but these are small amounts, you know, versus the 58,000 or, now 401ks are, you know, last year were 20,500, now they're 27,000. Um, we also deal with defined benefit plans. This is where we bring in, we, we have what's called a value added support team. These are other professionals we work with and bake into our process, but they can help small business owners. And sometimes we get this call that they're having a really large tax event. I mean, I've had calls, someone an attorney, for example, we settled a large case has taken us seven, eight years to get there. There's a million dollars that came in and which is way more than we're paying ourselves. And we have a giant tax event. It, depending upon their age, we can custom do this. I had, I had a small law firm did this a couple of years ago, took a deduction for $150,000. I, I had another case and that means they contributed $150,000 to a plan for one year. So that was a pretty nice income offset. And in another case, there was a business owner. There was a sale of a portion of his business. He was an old, you know, in his 60s, mid, mid to late 60s, he was able to contribute $400,000 in one oh year and offset that amount of income. So, you know, if he's in a higher tax bracket, that might be a couple hundred thousand dollars in tax savings yeah. right there. So those are super powerful, and then it lets them super fund their retirement, and we work with what's called third-party administrators. We know several throughout the country. A lot are local here. They're great. I'm looking to have one on the podcast to do a much deeper dive into this space, but they've worked with every kind of business. They understand the dynamics. They understand the limits, all the admin what's necessary to keep everyone in compliance with the Department of Labor because these are ERISA plans. So a lot of info there, love retirement plans. And when we can tactically manage them, they're, they're even better. All right. Now, you've been talking about retirement, all the different kinds yeah. of plans, how to set them up. But there is something when it comes to retirement that I think everybody goes to immediately. Oh, my God, my Social Security. <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. My social security. So yeah, that's, that's a good point. Some of those limits on the payments are going up and that's a good thing, but I talked a lot about inflation, right? right. So this year it went up by 5.9%. And this is after a number of years where it didn't go up at all. We should but say too, just, this is, we're talking about the cost of living here, cost of living, the cost of living yeah. adjustment. Yeah. yeah. But what I'm getting at here is, by the way, if you're doing your taxes and you're paying attention, if you're an employee, you see these amounts taken out of your paycheck. 6.2% of your wages up to $147,000 is pulled out for Social Security and an additional 1.45 for Medicare. You know, that's a good number. That's a mm -hmm. lot of your earnings going in. If you're self-employed or a business owner, guess what? You're paying twice that 12.4% <laughs> to social security of everything you earn and 2.9% into Medicare. So right there, we're talking almost 16%. That's a big contribution over many, many, many years. So point I'm driving at here is you've made a large investment in that you have a, you have a retirement plan and that needs to be optimized too. And so we work with folks. We give them a lot of guidance if they desire it. 
in other words, like depending upon the year of birth, there's a thing called full full retirement, retirement. age, right? Mm-hmm. It might be age 66, 67. You, one can defer out till age 70 if one can can hold off on those payments and they're they're able to do that. And you actually get for each year you hold off an 8% bump up in your pay. So we help people with that. We'll, we'll have a conversation. We actually have software. We have outside experts we can bring in. The, the maximum benefit these days is thir- $3,345 per month. But you've put in all those years for these things, and it's a very important benefit. So we help people optimize that. We can have a conversation. I just want to let folks know that that that's something we can do. We'll we'll look, we'll talk about things like health, longevity. You know, are you healthy? Do you, you know? Mm-hmm. And then and then some levels there's some complicated stuff we could get in if someone you know is looking at their spouse's benefit. You know, these kinds of things. If they're divorced, if they've lost someone, or if they remarry, we can bring in experts if that's needed to optimize that. But I, I just want to let folks know that's a conversation we have with our clients, we can bake that into the process. If you're managing your 401k optimally and you're managing this, these are all things that tie together as part of our process to really put you in a good position. And, and these are things you've worked at for years and years and years. Yeah. And then when the, when the actual payout comes, you, you just want to make intelligent, informed decisions. You don't want to be kicking yourself. That's for sure. Kicking yourself later. Yeah. Yeah. Though the money's coming out, it's you, that's all, uh, you don't have a choice in that matter, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. How can listeners reach you, Rob? There's so much you covered here and so much of it. I mean, my ears went up going, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, how can people reach you? I do want to use this. They, they can reach me. They can call my office. You can email me. I'm at seia.com signature estate and investment advisors. I do want to use this as a call to action. If you are anxious, if you are concerned, if you want a sounding board, if you want to have a discussion and see if we'd even be a good fit, or, you know, certainly if you're like connected to a client of ours, we'd love to have a conversation, but I'm pretty easy to reach. Those are the ways, you know, I, I just don't want to see people anxious or frozen into inaction or concerned or worried or not knowing what they can do about it because we we work on this but linkedin facebook my office email the usual means yep all right and that is rob curtis c-u-r-t-i-s-s don't leave off that last s all right follow this podcast for the newest episodes and share with others especially if you care about them i'm patrice sakura and let's talk again later Thank you for listening to the Millionaire Next Door podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Signature Estate and Investment Advisors or Royal Alliance Associates Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.